Hello, everybody, and welcome to our overview of Mark chapter 12. And I just want to remind everybody who's watching and tuning in that as we go through these overviews of the chapter, this is just to get an understanding of what this chapter is talking about. But our goal, our passion, and our mission is that us as a church, everyone in our church, learns to dive into the scripture, learns to dissect the word, and learns to get a revelation and understanding for ourselves. Our goal is not that we depend on uh, anyone else to try and understand the word, but that we can go to the word ourselves. So this is, this is just an overview to help us do that and to grow in our devotional life. Okay, so let's jump right in. We're Mark chapter 12, and as we're doing this, we are actually looking at some of the uh, interactions that Jesus has with some religious leaders and some other people. And this is actually the last week of ministry of, of Jesus' earthly ministry before he goes to the cross. So I'm going to break this up in about six sections. And if I could title this chapter anything, I would call it Tension, Traps, and Teaching. Just a simple way to remember what this whole chapter is about. Tension, there's going to be some traps, and there's going to be some teaching. So let's look at it. Let's start from Mark chapter 12. We're going to go from verse 1, and we see the story, uh, the parable of the vineyard. It says in Mark 12, Jesus began teaching them with stories. It says, a man planted a vineyard. He built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and move to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. The owner then sent another servant, but they insulted him and beat him over the head. Then it says, verse 5, the next servant he sent was killed. Others he sent were either beaten or killed verse 6 until there was only one left his son whom he loved dearly are we getting an idea of who he's talking about here we'll explain it just a second the owner finally sent him thinking surely they will respect my son verse 7 but the tenant farmer said to one another here comes the heir to his to this estate let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves So they grabbed him and murdered him, and they threw his body out of the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do, Jesus asked? I tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. Didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? So let's talk about this for a second. We're talking about what is this whole idea of the vineyard? What does all this represent? Well, let's break this down. We can see that there's different characters in just this parable. We have the vineyard, which represents the people of God. It's the people of Israel. And then we see the tenants. The tenants represent, and we can see uh, the tenants represent the uh, religious leaders, the ones who were given the uh, responsibility to care for the vineyard or to care for the people. And then we can see the landowner, which represents God. And we know the landowner represents God because he sent messenger after messenger after messenger until he finally sent his dearly loved son. And who is he talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is talking about himself here. So he says this in verse 10. He says, didn't you ever read in this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see. So Jesus gives this message now and he begins teaching and the religious leaders right now are listening to this and they're getting infuriated. They're very, very upset. Why? Because they know Jesus is talking about them. It says in verse 12, the religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus because they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. So just an overview, what does all this mean? They brought in, they they rejected the messengers and they killed them. Well, this is all Jesus is telling about what has taken place up until this time. The religious leaders continued to reject the messengers of God. And when they they were rejecting the prophets, who always foretold about the coming of Jesus. And 
They rejected the message. And not only did they reject those messages, but they would eventually reject Jesus himself, which is what they were doing right now, rejecting Jesus. But I love that this story shows we can see how patient and loving God actually is with us. That he would send messenger after messenger after messenger, hoping to capture our hearts and hoping to capture the hearts of the people. But and, and as God sent messenger after messenger, it shows how much he's patient with us and loving and wants our attention. Finally, he sends his own son. But the Bible says here, it says here that the religious leaders would then reject uh, the, uh, the, the, it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. What does this mean? Jesus is calling himself the cornerstone. What, what does that mean? He's basically, he's calling himself the Savior, the Messiah. It's the one stone that, that it's, it's a capstone. It's the stone that matters the most in all of the building. Without it, you can't build on it. Jesus is calling himself the Savior, the Messiah. And he quotes this, this psalm that is talking about the Messiah. And he's referring to himself as a cornerstone. The religious leaders, they're not happy about this. And they will later in scripture, we'll see that Peter will call them out in the book of Acts. He'll call them out for rejecting Jesus, the cornerstone. Wow. I pray we never get to that point where we reject Jesus out of our lives and we push him away and we reject his messages and we reject his word. Let's get to a point where we receive the word that God has for us. We receive Jesus and we receive his love once and for all. I pray that today you would receive the love of Jesus and maybe you've been pushing away, but know this, God is patient. His kindness leads us to repentance. That if there's been, you felt like you've rejected Jesus over and over, know this, Jesus is still knocking at your heart's door and you can welcome him into your heart today. Let's continue to go to the next section. The, sec the next section I call the tax trap. The tax trap. So let's start from verse 13. It says, later, the leaders sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could get arrested. Okay, this is interesting because Pharisees and these Herodians, they weren't really buddies, but because they both didn't like Jesus, they started to team up <laughs> because they were trying to trap Jesus. So they came up with this great idea. Let's ask him this question and let's trap him because if he answers either way, he's going to get in trouble and we have a reason to lock him up. So this, they try to trap him. So look at this, verse 14. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Okay, so Jesus knew what their, where their heart was. They were trying to act like, oh, Jesus, you're great. You're truthful. You're honest. What a teacher. But really in their heart, they wanted to trap Jesus. So there was some hypocrisy there and Jesus smelled it right away. He could call it out. So verse, uh, later in verse 15, it says, Jesus saw through their hypocrisy and said, why are you trying to trap me? Why are you trying to trap me? Show me a Roman coin and I'll tell you. I love the, the, the wisdom of Jesus here is so profound. It's so, it's so amazing. So this is what they did. So he asked, he asked that brilliant question and he says, show me a coin. And then they give him the coin. And when they handed it to him, he says, whose picture and title are stamped on it? They said, Caesar's. Okay, well, then Jesus said, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And his reply completely amazed them. What a brilliant question that Jesus asked. Whose image is on this coin? Caesar's image. Okay, then give to Caesar what belongs to him. And then give to God what belongs to God. Notice, since the coin had the image of Caesar on it, it belonged to Caesar. I have a question for you. What has the image of God stamped on it? Do you know? The answer is us. We have the image of God. The Bible says that we were created in his image. And Jesus is making a reference back to Genesis that man was created in the image of God. What Jesus was saying here is, yes, of course, pay your taxes, give to Caesar what belongs to him, give him this coin, but give to God what belongs to him, which is us. Jesus was literally saying, we got to give God everything of ourselves. 
give God our whole life. We're created in the image of God. And God, more than anything, and we'll learn later in the scripture, wants a relationship with you. God is interested in all your material possessions and all these other things and uh, 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 all these gifts and sacrifices and talents. What he wants most is your heart, your love, and a relationship with you. He wants your life. And Jesus is saying here, let's give God what belongs to him, which is us. What an amazing answer to this trap. They try to trap him, but they couldn't trap Jesus here. It says the whole crowd was amazed because this is some wisdom they had never seen before. So let's go to the next section, the next trap. This is the resurrection trap. (laughs) I call it the resurrection trap. They had another question to, to try and trap him. This starts from verse 18 and we'll go to verse 27. It says this, then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees Religious leaders who say there's no resurrection from the dead, they pose this question. So this group of people, they were religious leaders, but they did not believe in resurrection after death. They didn't believe that we would eventually resurrect. Teacher, this is what they're asking. Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife without children, his brother could marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there are seven brothers, the oldest one married then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but also died without children. And it keeps going on and on. It repeats for all seven brothers. So, so they're saying, okay, what happens if she marries, um, you know, she's eventually married to all seven brothers. And then, it's, and then when she dies, they're asking, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Because all seven of these men married her. All right, so Jesus again can sniff out that this is a trap. And but he has such a a, a brilliant and uh, such a profound answer full of wisdom. And this is what he does. He responds by calling out their two mistakes. He says, you made two mistakes here. Two mistakes that they make. It says right here in verse 24, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures. Number one. And number two, you don't know the power of God. Wow. He was saying, here are some mistakes you made. You don't know the word and you don't know God's power. Just pause there for a second. Let's, let's, let's bring this into reality, into our life. How many of us have made mistakes because we didn't know the word and we didn't know the power of God? I could just think back to my life. How many times I've made mistakes many times I've drifted from God. I remember when, when I was in college, I had, I had a word from God. God told me what I was there to do. And I began to grow distant and cold. And I began to uh, not be so in tune with the word. And I began to, it began, what it did for me is I, I began to become numb to the power of God. And I began to make so many mistakes in my walk. Uh, uh, only to come back to the feet of Jesus in repentance and say, God, I've made a mistake. But how many of us have made those same mistakes where we don't know the word and we don't know his power? So Jesus is, is letting these Sadducees know here, you're making a mistake. You don't really know the word and you don't know what God can do. God can definitely resurrect. And in the word, he says so. So he points to these things and and Jesus could see he knows that they didn't believe in the resurrection. And he tells them they're making a serious error for this reason, for not believing that Jesus, uh, God, would resurrect. So he answers this question by showing them, of course, that there's no marriage in heaven. He goes on to say, uh, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. And what he's saying is. Basically, when we die, we won't have a marriage in heaven. Marriage is meant for this earth. That marriage has a timeline and it's been given a purpose here in this earth. And it's a ministry to minister to others on this earth. And that's what it's for. And when we pass on, marriage has had accomplished its mission. So then he goes on to reemphasize that there will be a resurrection. It shows that God is not the God of the dead, but God of the living. 
He says, verse 26, but now as to whether the dead will be raised, haven't you ever read about this in the writings of Moses in the story of the burning bush? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. You have made a serious error. He's telling them, you've made a big mistake here. God is saying this, and he, what he's saying to us is, I am the God of the living. What, what, what does that mean? The Bible says that Jesus, he is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him will live even after dying. What does that mean? That even after we pass on this earthly body, we will continue to live in eternity forever. We will live. So what God is saying is, I am the God of the living, not the dead. Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection power. They did, uh, surely would not believe that. Jesus would resurrect from the dead, but they're going to soon find out. Let's go to the next section. Section number four. This is the greatest commandment from verses 28 to 34. Let's take a look at this. So now one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening. So this is one, another teacher of religious law. He's kind of standing around. He's listening intently. And I believe what's happening to his heart, he's really starting to get a picture of who Jesus is. So he asks a genuine question. This isn't a trap here. He asks a real question from his heart. So he was listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered so well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It begins there. The most important thing we can do is love God with everything. And I love that he says that with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. My heart, I think of my affections, my adoration, my worship. When I think of my soul, I think of my will, my, my uh, it's even some emotion, my, my, my decisions. When I think of my mind, I think of my thoughts. What, what overwhelms my thoughts? What am I thinking of? The Bible says, think of things. Think of these things that please the Lord. I love Him with my mind, and I think of ways to please the Lord and with my strength. When I think of strength, I think of faith becoming works. Not only do I love Him on the inside, but I love Him on the outside in the way I live, the way I act, the way I go about uh, my lifestyle. I love Him with everything. And then he says this, the second, in verse 31, the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. You know, God's desire is that our, our first priority, he's making it clear here, our first priority is love. Loving God and loving others. God desires love. And when we truly love God, everything else will follow. Our obedience follows, our sacrifice, our, our worship, our adoration to God. But when we don't love God, we do things with no love, with no heart. And the Bible says, without love, these things profit nothing. They have no value, they have no worth. And Jesus pairs this command, not just with loving God, but he says to love your neighbor as yourself. Because we can't say we love God and hate our neighbor. God, I love you so much. But I can't stand, I hate this person, I hate him. We can't say that. It's like oil and water, it doesn't mix. Love and hate, it, it, it cannot blend. It's like light and darkness. They cannot exist and be friends together. When we say we love God, we must also love our brothers and sisters. When we have the love of God in our hearts, it really does translate and manifest as love for others. With God's heart, we can't help but show compassion for others and meet their needs. And, and, and here's another thing. How do you know you tr can truly love somebody, that you can do something for them without that expectation that you're going to get something in return? Can we love somebody that way? God is saying this is the greatest commandment. Love God and love people. That's the greatest and most important commandment we can live by. 
So this teacher, he hears this. And again, he starts to really, his mind starts to adjust. Because all the teachers of religious law, their objective is really to get uh, adoration, to get fame, to get status. And so now he, as a teacher of religious law, begins to see and realize the truth. Loving people is, and loving God is the most important thing. So verse 32, the, chief, the teacher of religious law replied, says, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. His heart is changing right now in this moment. One conversation with Jesus, one encounter with him, one word from Jesus and his heart from stone begins to soften and it begins to transform his eyes. It's like scales are being, come, being lifted off of his eyes and he's beginning to see the truth. And verse 34, realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him, ask him any more questions. Jesus said in that moment, you could see the transformations happening. That's all we need is a word from God. To understand, to receive his word, things will change. We'll see transformation. And our lives will never be the same again. Let's keep moving forward. Section five. I call this section, beware, beware. So later, it says in verse 35, later as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple, he asked, why do the teachers of religious law claim that the Messiah is the son of David? So now Jesus is asking a question here. He turns his attention to his people. He begins to, to teach them and ask this question really pertaining to himself, the Messiah. So verse 36, for David himself, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. So Jesus is quoting what David said. And David said, the Lord said to my Lord. So he's asking this question. He's basically saying in verse 37, since David called himself called the Messiah, my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Now, why is he asking this question? Well, he's asking this question because the religious leaders, they really thought they knew everything there was to know about the coming Messiah. Jesus was making a very clear point here. They did not know. They were not ready. They, they, they did not know, and it really, they fabricated an idea of who the Messiah was coming to be. When all along, it was all mapped out in scripture after scripture of how the Messiah would come. And Jesus, the Messiah, came and did exactly what was prophesied over and over and over and over and over and over again. He did exactly what was prophesied. But these religious leaders had such this, an idea of who God was supposed to be that they, they missed it. They missed it. So it goes on to say, the, lar the large crowd listened to him with great delight. And then in verse 38, Jesus also taught, beware of these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and and to be the head at the table banquets, yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be more severely punished. Jesus is letting the people know, beware. Beware of how the religious leaders, the ones who are supposed to care and teach the people, they've been given that assignment, but they've made it all about themselves instead. They had this idea of who God, God is supposed to be, and they've misled people. And now Jesus is saying, you got to beware. Why? Because these are people that love the image of being important. They loved and demanded recognition from others. They love status, and they love to manipulate people for their property. These were all things that were the opposite of what Jesus came to do. Jesus said this, I come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus was 
showing that these religious leaders were not the leaders that he's called them to be. So he's saying, beware, don't become like that. These people, these, they prayed these long prayers and appeared holy, but their hearts were corrupt. Let's be careful. And I know we see that, we think, how evil those people are. Man, they're so wicked, but let's be careful. Let's be careful that we don't fall in that same trap. And we begin to fall in love with the image, the idea of being holy, but we lose it in our heart. Jesus said this, he says this, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Let's be careful that we don't get so comfortable with the routine of things that we lose our heart's affection for the Lord. And it becomes a show. It becomes a, a routine. It becomes a day in and day out. We just come on Sunday or we watch on Wednesday, but no real relationship with God. Let's get back to the place where we really spend our time with the Lord and we love Him with all of our heart so that it is not just an act, but it comes from here. It comes from our heart. So this leads to our last section where we see a widow. It's interesting that Jesus just talked about these religious leaders taking advantage of widows. And then we see a widow come up in this next section. I call this the widow's offering. It starts from verse 41 and goes to just verse 44. It says, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus calls his disciples over to him, and he wants to teach them, wants to show them this lesson. He says, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave with a tiny part of the surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. So he goes from answering all these questions to, to then teaching these people and this, these, you know, avoiding these traps and then now calling out the religious leaders to now just, observing. He sits near the collection box and he sees what people are putting in and he's observing not just what they're doing, he's, he's observing their hearts. He notices that there are people giving large amounts, of course, but then he sees this poor widow giving these two small coins. He uses this as a teaching moment. And what is he saying here? He's showing, he's showing us this, that she gave everything she had to live on. And here's the point. It was big to her. But everything else these religious leaders or these other people were giving, it may have been big to some people, but it wasn't big to them. It was a tiny part of their surplus, and she gave everything she had to live on. Here's something we could live by. If it's big to you, it's big to God. If it's everything to you, it's everything to God. But if it's nothing to you, it's, it's a little bit we can do. I can give God a little bit of my time. I can give God a little bit of my effort. I can... I can throw in here and there, maybe more than the next person. But if it's not a lot to you, it's not a lot to God. This widow gave everything. She gave her whole heart. She didn't hold anything back from the Lord. Her giving showed where her faith was. Her faith was in God. It wasn't in her own provision. It was in the Lord. This concludes Mark chapter 12. He ends there on a powerful teaching about where our faith is. And we can see this whole chapter is just about these interactions, but throughout all of it, Jesus teaches us some main key takeaways to love God more than anything, to love others, to put our faith in Him, to live with true, genuine worship, not to put on a show, but to really love God. This we can learn today. And I pray that as you've heard this message, if you've heard this overview of Mark chapter 12, that you would spend this week diving into the scripture Dive into Mark chapter 12, get revelation from the Lord, hear what the word says, learn about God's power and allow his love to totally reveal himself to you. I pray and I believe that God will touch you in a way that you've never been touched before. And I pray that maybe you haven't given your life to Jesus. Let this be the moment you surrender everything. We love you and we're so thankful that you're tuning in with us. Let's have a great week. Let's grow. Let's dive into the Word. God bless.